Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. We're back after a hard day on the cobbles in Pararu Bay, doing all the five-star sectors. You'll see that video probably in a couple of weeks. Uh, back in the Flandrian Hotel for our last evening. It's been a big week in Flanders. We've been all about the traps. We've yeah, and went in, even in, went into Paris or oh, not Paris. Saw <laughs> signs to Paris. We, we marched on Paris. No, we, we went to France today, and now we're back before we go home in our separate ways tomorrow. We're pretty cooked. And uh, this episode of the weekly show, which is back, has recaps of some of the Benji's local races, uh, or our local race, my local races this week. <laughs> um, decathlon still being good. Previews of Catalonia, where Poggy uh, has his first big stage race this year. Harold Becker, Brugge de Panach, and Wevelhem as well. Armstrong banning hugs. He's doing some banning, some suspending of his own. Uh, Richard Pluga with the AIGCP. Lefebvre's unprecedented fine and this random salary cap thing that got penciled in. But yeah, how are you going, Benji? You blanketed up. You had cramps yesterday, which you managed to hide pretty well in the live. <laughs> live pod. How are you holding up? Well, I was suffering yesterday. I've had uh, quite a bit of hours on the bike this week, which in hindsight is good. I've done things that I wasn't planning to do this week. So in hindsight, I'm happy with whatever we did. We explored Flanders, we explored Roubaix. We we're talk about it a bit towards the end of the podcast. But first of all, I swear at the start of this week that in my calendar it said, no weekly show. How did that happen? Yeah, well, we're, we're here and there's like the Flandrian Hotel is like a scholarship program for, for young athletes to come and, and train and stay a while in Flanders, go to the races, etc. And Will, one of the uh, that sort of scholarship guys, I'm cooked, as you can tell, I'm fucked, right? <laughs> Me too. And this guy sits at the end of the table. He's looking at me now and he says, the fucker, he says, what's happening in the weekly show? What's going on in the weekly show? I was like, hey, we missed one week. Like, <laughs> we missed one week. He's like, what's happening in the weekly show? And so we've been guilt tripped into doing it. But actually, we got, and then I looked and I said, there's a fair bit of news because, yeah, obviously, I've got to get up for a flight at 5.30 in the morning. And I've just rode around Roubaix today. But um, no, nah, he's right. We should keep it going. We've got to keep on track. So he is correct. But um, sometimes the bearer of bad news gets, gets hit with a stick. So on to <laughs> <laughs> the on to Nocker, of course, which we saw in person on Wednesday, which was cool to see. Which uh, we saw in person. We saw it blitz by in like oh, three we, seconds. Oh, we saw the race. <laughs> we, saw, yeah. we saw the race in person, unplanned. Yep. Uh, Benji said that the race didn't cross our, our route. It did. So he, he I'm, I'm calling everybody. He, <laughs> route was the same as the Nocker, of course. Route. So he, uh, no, you know what he said? We said, Benji, you checked the route. He said, yeah. Then we get there and then there's a Marshall signal giver. And he's there, and uh, Luke also had major issues. We saw a clash of Flemish and Dutch cultures. Luke had major issues with the guy's placement of a barrier, so they got into it. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was kicking off. And then uh, um, Benji said, uh, said, Benji, didn't you check the route? He said, oh, no, I just checked the climbs. <laughs> I just checked the climbs didn't overlap. I was like, well, unfortunately for you, Yagra is a cobbled sector that's not a climb, and this, they... <laughs> These guys do it. So, so is the hard hook, so is the other yeah. one. <laughs> so that wasn't very helpful. Uh, but we got to see the race, which is good. Uh, I think we, we saw a crash in a corner. I don't know if Hayter crashed in that corner. He was at the back of the group. Maybe he had to unclip. But um, I'm team Hayter this year. So Nocker, of course, one of the most dangerous races on the calendar. A huge crash in the final. I, uh, I, did, I did a recon of it the day before unintentionally. And I came through, yeah, 500 meters to go on a downhill and I said there's no way they do this and uh turns out they do and they had a big crash Merlier at times his sprint, sprint perfectly and just he, he he had so much time to, I've never seen a sprint post up that's got to be the longest sprint post up victory for a long long time he literally stopped pedaling with five full seconds to go he straight up gapped the others in the sprint then like Jakobsen and Philipsen sprinting against each other. Looked like they were sprinting against each other for a victory, but no, 20 meters ahead is Merlier who just shot away. So what a victory. That's three years in a row, Merlier in Nokura Kursa, I think. So he keeps on winning there. It's also a, a cobble sprint, which Philipsen after the race said, sprinting on cobble is not my thing. Hey, <laughs> me neither. So I guess we're on the same page there. Kopecky won the, the women's version of the race. She attacked earlier than Merlier, even though Merlier was a sprint, but... Might as well have been an attack at this point, solo finisher. Kopecky, also solo finisher earlier, also a victory. So, hey, Belgium keeps winning. Well, and if you go to Tim Mollier's PCS, his top results, the first result is three times winning Daniel with Nocor, of course, not a Tour de France <laughs> stage. So, 
Um, I, I guess, yeah. It's a, it's a great race. But yeah, it's a, it's a dangerous one, that's for sure. And uh, Ackerman should have been disqualified, in my opinion. His move was really bad. Yep. And that uh, crashed Rickard. And then, but Rickard is also always moving when he finishes his sprint lead out. He moves back through the middle when he could pull off. So it just was it was a messy run in, but that's to be expected. Next day was GP Denat, which is over the border. Uh, obviously, Denat is from Denat to Roubaix is the last 100 kilometers of Paris Roubaix. And obviously, GP Denat is a cobbled race, but it's been raining a lot, really, really muddy. Uh, there's not as many cobbled sectors as Roubaix. There's only 12 uh, finishing in Dana. They do a loop, 199Ks, but they really jam them in together. They're, they're within about 60Ks after 120Ks into the race, 12 sectors. So you're hitting some pretty... A lot of them are different. Some of, the, uh, some of them are different. Some of them are the same. Like Saint Python rings a bell. Uh, but the snake. Apart the python, yeah. Uh, um... <laughs> But this, the, the sort of takeaway from this race was how muddy it was, Benji, and how it ended up almost not being a fast, but basically Stefan Kung pinballing the chase going down was really what defined how this race was won. Exactly, and that brings us to the days before where, where Lotto brought out the news that the news that the Lee would be riding GP oh, yeah. Dinah and Preden Kokseide instead of MSR to recover from his crash in the Saman. I was like, that sounds like a weird theory because those two races are dangerous compared to MSR. So, hey, he rode both and he crashed in, well, he crashed in this race, GP Dene. He was in that group of Kung that hit the ground. So the breakaway won, like you said, Yannick Steimler taking a victory for Q36.5, in their first victory of the year ahead of, um, ahead of who? Ahead yeah. of a man, mystery man that, Patrick is about to find out because my page isn't loading. Serial de Sal from Bingo. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it was three Belgians, two, three, four, and uh, Steimler. Q365 haven't really, in the Swiss team stakes, pro team stakes, Tudor have clearly outclassed them so far. Uh, this is their first yeah. win of the year. It's, it's probably their first, it's their biggest win ever, I would say. I would put this race above Almeria last year. Uh, and the team is only about 18 months old. Wait, so Glassenberg is yeah. South African. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Doug Wright is South African. Q36.5? Swiss. Is a Swiss company. Yeah, but Glencore, Glencore is Swiss. Oh, okay. This um, is, uh, it's getting difficult to keep track of why a certain team is a certain nation for, in my head, but hey. <laughs> Gla even Glasberg was, uh, he's a South African, but yeah, he made all his money as, uh, as the CEO of, Glas of uh, Glencore, an Swiss uh, commodities trading company. So oh, okay. he, I don't know if he has citizenship there, uh, but he certainly sort of probably resides there when he's has businesses there. So, and it's a good place to set up a cycling team as well. So I don't know whether they even, is that team a continuation of Quebecer? Not really. So for me, it's a new, it's a new structure. Yeah, it's a new structure, and I also don't feel like it has the same identity baked no, in. No, definitely not. Because when you look at the team, I'm not feeling the MT and Quebec vibes. No, no. And also, when it comes to the team itself, I'm still wondering if they're gonna keep on riding on Scots or whether Finrello will be their bikes in the future. Because Glassberg, Glassenberg, whatever, Glencore man, yeah. he um he now owns Pinarello as well. So that's gonna be curious. But anyway, Breda and and next up on the menu. Um, Belgian chat, chat GPT race, just like Nokia Kurs. And I will say, after like a week of doing loads of stuff, all these races like come hand in hand for me. I'm like, which race was the one where that rider did that thing? Lily was attacking with 100k to go in echelons. He was in second echelon. He was like, I see a front, first echelon ahead of me that I missed. Let me just attack from the second echelon to the first echelon like crazy and bridge that like, a, like he was the strongest rider in the race. And then in the final, he was leading out Tamino, who ended up crashing. Lunemaking was sprinting there, looked very strong with about 500 meters to go, with about 400 meters to go, with 200 meters to go. And then out of his wheel, the draft merchant of Arkea, he rises up and it's Luca Mozzato. He's winning. He's coming out of the draft, which is shocking. Also because they made him not just be the last man to lead out the other day in Le Semain. Yep. They had him second last. They had Mozzato, maybe Capio. Mm -hmm. And then Jente Bier Biermans. 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 
beer man. You're drinking beer, so. No, I wouldn't say Flandrian. Just call it 0% beer. Yeah. It's controversial. But That's true. They, he gets his opportunity here and he wins. And also such a strange race, but also a really interesting race. We watched the finish here. It's like Hen Wevelhem has the Kemmelbergs yeah. much closer to the finish. Yeah. And Demura, which is like a flat, it's actually below sea level and completely exposed to the wind. So if there's any wind, and there usually is, because we're really in the northwest of Flanders here and uh, on Coxeda or Bredena. So, and the Demura is what? It connects Ypres and that hilly area yeah. with the coast. Exactly. So you have to go there, go through there. And Hen Wevelhem has that flat area before the climbs and the climbs closer to the finish. This race is the opposite. They do the Kemmelberg mm -hmm. twice, one uh, Belvedere side, one Oswer side, but it, it's like 100 k from the finish. And then they went to that crosswind area, where, which you said, Benji. So a really difficult race uh, it looked like because of the wind conditions and also crazy headwind sprint. Uh, we've got to say the tactics of of DSM were really <laughs> strange. They basically had Patrick Eddy, who's a good rider. He's been coming up uh, progressively as a classics rider. I think he's always, I don't know if he's from Bendigo or Ballarat. I know he's from Victoria. He always does long rides in, I think, it, I think it's Bendigo. He's from Australia. I mean, yeah, Tom Bonin's from, uh, from Liege. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> uh, it's all the same, no? And the... <laughs> And you're in the Flandre <laughs> Hotel, you're saying that is all the same. <laughs> and he didn't relay with Lampard, Patrick Eddy. You got Lampard? Mm -hmm. Okay, not the best sprinter in terms of a classics guy, not the best sprinter. And then you have Patrick Eddy, who probably has to do, he's just got to give him a pull 20% of the work, 25%, yeah. and Lampard will probably pull, his, pull all the way to the line. We've seen Lampard, didn't he do it in Brugge de Pana? Where he had a sprinter behind and he towed two other guys with him who were relaying and they were quick guys. But also, even if he pulls more than 20-25%, you've got Liepins and Dejenkol behind who are unlikely to beat the likes of Gerben Thijs and Groenewegen, De Lee in a sprint on paper. Arvid De Klein also in the group. So, sorry, but Liepins is, is top 10 material for me here. Maybe a top 5 if he... Top 10 is like, yeah, he just expected case. And Herben Tayson came, won this race last year. Yep. And Ackerman, all those sort of guys, Tamino was fourth last year. No way. Leipzig is not even a top five favorite for this finish. Correct. And, and so for Eddie not to pull is completely insane. It's a dot pro. There's points on offer. Yep. I don't know if it was the team car because he did pull through once and then it looked like the team car told him not to. Crazy stuff. Um, and yeah, it comes back for a sprint mile side of wins, but just very, very odd uh, stuff indeed. The uh, last note is just two French races. They're one ones, uh, and we haven't been able to catch up to, with them. But it's just a, a continuation of a theme, which is decathlon keep winning. They yeah. they look like they're gonna they should run away with the French Cup this year. Paul uh, Lapera, who's another of these young guys, is now winning, not just getting good results. But you've got Bastion Tranchant, uh, who's the other one? Gotera. Prodom. Prodom. He's not so young, but he's Baudet. Baudin and now Paul Lapira winning uh, ahead of Alexis Renard in a solo today and he's 23 years old and that's two wins in a row like Cholet plus Classique Loire Atlantique but also next to that he had a top 10 at La Guiglia, a top 10 at Fondrome Classic like all those things together mean that he's continuously performing and I wonder when that step up above those 1.1s will come in. Because like top 10s at 1.pro, wins at 1.1. At some point, he might <coughs> he might be competing for 1.pro races when it comes to victories, is how I'm looking at it. But we're speaking about the rider, but we got to repeat. That jersey, they ain't cooking. Because in the Mazar, there was a moment where I fought an Israel rider had a puncture. And I looked back, and it was an Azure Desert rider. Like, sorry, but... They are so goddamn similar. R remind me of the fact that when SD Works had their color scheme two years ago that was so present in the women's peloton, the UCI went out of their way to punish a small continental team, the Andy Schleck team, to kill their jersey, to tell them to change their jersey. And then they hosted like a, a limited sale of all the stock they had and so forth. And now this year they completely forgot, forgot this rule existed because every team looks the same in men's cycling now. 
Well, yeah, I'm looking at the... Yeah, we already said before this even happened, why the UCI not making sure yeah. that people can see which team is which. That seems like a pretty important thing. And I, <laughs> I understand that Decathlon, they've just done a corporate rebrand. Like five days ago, uh, we, they did a corporate rebrand. I'm looking on their Instagram. This is like the corporation, Decathlon. And they've got... It, it doesn't necessarily match totally with the kit. The rebrand is almost a different color to that color that I'm seeing. So it's obviously because they've done that rebrand, the main sponsor, yeah. and I get it, they're paying all the money for the team, but the why does the kit... It, I don't see why that rebrand, even if they have to do something different with the kit, why it has to now match the, the Israel kit. They could have done something different to still keep decathlon happy that would still be in keeping with what the the jersey was which i thought was quite nice i know they got rid of the brown shorts but very very strange um very very difficult to make out so hopefully next year there might be better guidelines or enforced guidelines on kits not exactly matching hopefully but yeah binda binda so trofeo binda also today uh women's world tour race and i gotta be honest i didn't see the final yet i uh, I read what happened because we just arrived here at the hotel and we were like, let's jump into a weekly show. But the winner is Elisa Balsamo, head of Lotto Kopecky and Puck Petersen. Petersen once again performing in a World Tour race, so I'm, I'm happy to see that. But when I look at these results, I'm like, okay, so Balsamo was in group one. She didn't, Van Androoy was just off the back. Van Androoy must have controlled the hell out of that group or other teams must have controlled it for Balsamo because. Otherwise, I'm shocked that this group stayed together. Yeah, I mean, unless Royster kept it together for Kopecky against Balsamo. No way with with Kopecky's current sprint, they would surely think she's the favorite to beat even Balsamo. I know Balsamo hasn't looked that good this year, but another big win for her. Trek are looking very, very good this season, and they take an, away another victory from SD Works. Yep. Uh, with Kopecky on the start list, it wasn't like SD Works didn't send anybody; they sent the big gun. So. Uh, congrats to Little Trek, especially a race that's very important to them, probably the biggest Italian one-day race on on their calendar, and uh, a, a race that's been going on for a long time, and it's it's good this also... Yeah, there's no women's San Remo, but Binder sort of... It's done the hard yards for many years, filling that place on the Sunday after, after San Remo, giving the women a, a major Italian uh, one-day race. That's the racing this week. Previews now. The big race this week is Volta Catalunya. Uh, it has, for the first time turning up, uh, Catalunya will be very, very happy. Tare Pagaccia, two-time Tour de France champion and obviously winning a whole load of, others, of other things along the way. <laughs> he brings a stacked team. Almeida, Sivakov, Groschart, Navai, Novak, Soler. This is basically their Giro team, except you take out Almeida and put in Mika for their Giro team, and maybe not Sivakov. But it, it's a that's a crazy team for a one week uh, race of this color, uh, like with this parkour. Sepkus, Otterbrooks, the two guys for Visma Lisa bike. So we'll see if one week Kus can replicate what GC Kus did last year in three weeks. Uh, they also have uh, Mr. Lemon. <laughs> see what he can do. Uh, no Remco, but there is Mikel Landa. So he's leading for Sudar Quickstep. Probably, I would say, Spain's best hope of a result here. As well as uh, Grant Thomas, Ethan Hater, Egan Bernal. Well, wow, Egan Bernal, is he, got a, is he doing like, can I race every World Tour Race Challenge this year? What's going on? <laughs> Maybe every Grand Tour as well afterwards, but... Next to those teams, I'm looking at Bahrain. Can they surprise with like a Pools or a Caruso? Stuff like that. But Lenny Martinez, also curious how close he can get, but I'm, I've got a feeling that it's going to be as close as he was in, in Gran Camino, for example, which he put him that race, if I recall. He got third on GC. Yeah, yeah. I don't expect him to necessarily get third in GC here, but I, I'd love to see him in the top 10, close to top five, maybe. Stuff like that. Give him some some more GC results going into the future. Bora has a pretty stacked team, to be honest. Vlasov, Higita, um, and that's that, kind of where that it ends. That team's useless. <laughs> that's kind of where it ends. <laughs> the stacked team was two riders and support. <laughs> well, and Vlasov was the rumor, the rumor came from Chiro. The rumor, Chiro, I think he had a few swings and misses yep. uh, on Twitter, the, the Italian uh, journalist. 
with uh, transfer rumors. But this one makes sense. He says Vlasov to well, he said Vlasov to Astana was was rumored, and then it came out that someone close to Vlasov said that uh, he was going to extend with Bora. But anyway, he's leading them at Catalonia. Uh, he looked good in Paris on the weekend, the last weekend, obviously. Uh, Maxim van Gils, I'm keen to see how he goes. Uh, no Leonard van Eidfeldt, though, on the star list. Somewhat surprising because he was good here last year for Lotto Destiny. I think there was an article for on HLN uh, that said he had a knee injury. Okay. Uh, something with a swelling around his knee is what I read, so... All right. So, but I think he was planning to do it. Simon Yates, uh, he's had a, about a month and a half off after uh, winning a Lula Tour, uh, which was probably his second biggest race of the year. And he... Yeah, he comes here. I'm not sure what shape he'll be in. Maybe he's been at altitude, but I'm keen to see how he goes. Uh, Bahrain, Caruso, Pools, Haig. Uh, but really, everyone's going to be looking at Tari Pagacha and that yeah. team. Like, there's just no one else that really... He should clean this up. He really, Yeah, he really should. There's no Avonapol, no Roglic, no Vingegaard. There's Enric Maas, there's there's Koos. But especially when you look at the parkour, for example, San Feliu de Gijols. The opening stage, I think Roglic won last year. Yeah. Well, if Roglic can win it in an uphill sprint, Pagacha can win it. Yeah. Stage two is a Uni Puerto up Valter, which is uh, about a 30 minute climb. Good climb for him, I would say. Stage three to Portane. It is three long climbs. Uh, and this goes past, not my house, but I'd probably go down to La Seu to go check out the race. This crosses from east to west Catalonia out to Portane, which is quite north of there. There's not much going on. Uh, these roads are really like the Porta Canto. They're nice roads, but there's really sparse. It's a high mountain stage, but those climbs are not that long, and they're not like the Tourmalet and Portanese. Yeah, I guess it's long to 2,000 meters. That's the real danger stage, if there is any danger stage for Pagacha. Uh, then there's a couple of Caden Grove style sprints. I think he's out of the race, uh, maybe with an injury. We haven't really spoken about the sprinters. There is a, a 6.5k, 6% climb. Uh, on stage five, not too far from the finish. Stage six, I think, I don't know if Sepku's literally designed this stage, <laughs> but he did a tweet saying his ideal Catalonia stage, and then the organizers actually made it. Uh, it's, from, <laughs> it's a lap around Berga with like 4,000 meters climbing with loads of climbs, finishing up Keralt, uh, which is 6K, 7% up to, uh, I think there's a chapel up there. And uh, that's, it still looks like a really good Pagacha stage. I'll be honest, looking at this stage, I don't care if Sepka's designed it or not, but if he <laughs> yeah. did, then he needs to design more stages because this is a banger of a stage. It's kind of a raid stage where yeah, yeah. there's opportunities on the, on the third last climb. Basically, if you look at the parkour, two leading climbs for a breakaway to form. Then in the middle of the stage, a proper climb, 14.6 kilometers at 7%, but the last 5.5 kilometers are 11%. Yeah. So wow. that's a launching <laughs> pad. <laughs> and then you've got two more climbs afterwards where, I don't know, maybe in the in the descent towards it, uh, the, uh, the satellite rider could be helpful, stuff like that. So I'm getting the vibes here. And if if I was an organizer, they'd be like, Sipkas, design my entire Grand Tour. Yeah, and it's maybe that that's right. But I mean, good luck someone trying to do anything if UAE can control it with that team. You've got Sivakov and Vine looking at you and Groshar. <laughs> but... There was, uh, in terms of weather, there was a big snow dump last week around Catalonia and mm -hmm. uh, especially around where they're going up to because they're going up to about over 1,700 meters at least three times in this race. Uh, about a meter of snow up there just about in a weekend, but the weather this week looks really, really good, so the roads should be all okay, like over 15 degrees. Uh, stage 7 is the Monjuic circuit in Barcelona, which you should know, where uh, Remco beat Roglic last year. And this is the thing, like say Poggy not going to happen most likely <laughs> but say say he has an issue or something on stage yeah. three or or there is the raid you say on stage six if, if he if Sepp Koos is 30 seconds ahead of him on GC or 20 yeah. seconds he can just drop everybody on that Monjuic circuit yep and, and solo well Gacha wins this race whatever yeah. happens he should well, not sure about whatever happens but 99% of the time, Pogacha wins this race. And that's, that's for me, Catalonia. Like, well, but is this the hardest one-week race he's ever done, parkour-wise? It's, it's one of the hardest one-week races of the year. When you look at the parkour, it obviously depends how they yeah, race it. The competition is like, sorry, but Thomas and Bernal in a one-week race, I don't see even close to, to Pogacha, so he should be cleaning this. Like Simon, Landa, Simon Yates. This is Andalusia last year for me. No, this is harder. The, park, no, the parkour is harder, but the yeah. starlist isn't. Simon Yates. 
Simon Yates isn't going to clean up Pogacar, my friend. No. Mm, not with the team they've sent. <laughs> not having it. <laughs> Whatever team they sent. Maybe Van Aertveld if he'd been here. But yeah, Pogacar's going to be the heavy favourite. Should, uh, should win pretty easily. In terms of sprinters, there's Cockard. And uh, Caden Groves is no longer on the start list. He won at least two stages, or at least one stage last year. Ethan Hayter, really, this has got to be it. Yeah. This is the, there's a couple of stages here which are absolutely perfect for him, notwithstanding stage one where, okay, it's uphill, so yeah, Poggy's in with a decent chance. But, I mean, stage four and, and stage five in particular, he really has got to be contesting those stages for the win. So I guess that's why also he's here. So it's a good race selection for him, but we got to, they'll, Ineos will be hoping to see something. Uh, Brugge de Pana. Starts in Bruges, obviously, also can be affected by crosswinds. Actually, quite right. a good race. It's exactly the same you mentioned after uh, already. Hento Evergame has the Mouren before that, that climbing segment. Brugge de Pone, it, it they is. Do, they just do laps of it. Yeah, they just do laps of the Mouren. <laughs> There's no climbs. They just do laps, <laughs> hoping that the wind will pick up and the, race, and the race will split. I think that Brugge de Pone should be a, an uncapped race where they do... Laps until the wind has effect. No, until the one rider is solo. It can't, <laughs> it can't finish in a sprint. So if there's still two people, it has to be solo. Yeah, that's and everybody <laughs> that is not in the front group gets yeah, eliminated. Yeah. It's so, basically a the moon elimination race. What's that on the track? Even elimination that? race. Okay, yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> but yeah, it's, if the wind is right, it can be a really good race. Malia Phillipson are on the start list. They both have been, uh, should be good in this sort of race. They're great in the crosswinds. Tessin as well. Fantastic Bauhaus has been looking really good. So it's, it's a race where, because it's so flat, that you can see the sprinters at actually attacking and being aggressive, trying to create echelons. So I'll really be trying to watch that race, although I think it might be on the same day as Catalonia's banger stage, the big, the big mountain one. Uh, but I can't wait to see Philipson and Melia go head-to-head -head once again, because if, if Melia wins this in a sprint ahead of Philipson, and there's no excuse, ah, I don't like cobbled uphill sprints, then I think some people will be saying who's the best sprinter in the world. Yep. I guess Philipson did just win San Remo yesterday, so well, but Brugge de Pana, San Remo. Yes, we'll have to wait for the uh, award show at the end of the year, but yeah. women's race is also about the best sprinter. Uh, we've got Charlotte de Cole versus Wiebes versus Balsamo versus uh, a lot of good riders in this race. So I'll look forward to that one as well. Last year that was arguably... The best women's race of the year for me. Okay, fair enough. But for Georgie uh, winning, right? Oh, I can't remember. With Jazz Trap in that group? Yeah, DSM. Was he was crashing good. everyone, or was it kind of able game? When she went off the side, did a bit of a. She, and she didn't get disqualified. Like, no. she didn't get, like, Matthew did the same thing, yeah. and she didn't get shit, and hers was really bad too. Yeah. She crashed uh, Kopecky. Yeah. Uh, E3 Haraldbeck is on Friday. That's probably the uh, I, I don't know if it's bigger than Hendel him, but they're the two biggest one day races of the week on Friday and Sunday. Uh, E3 on Friday is like the watered down version of uh, the Tour of Flanders 200k's rather than 260, and as well, it has they do the Paterberg before the Claremont. Benji has uh, got some Flemish intel that the Paderberg is all good, despite the work still being done when we were there on uh, Thursday, and that it should be all good for Friday. So if uh, the source of that is Benji, and uh, yeah, all complaints to him if that's not true, but <laughs> I think I think it's pretty safe to say they should have they yeah. should have it fixed up for what well, maybe the second biggest race or in, in in the region. And if they don't, it's a mountain bike descent race, so. Yeah. Might be entertaining. Uh, the start list, yeah, Van der Poel against Wout van Aert for Alperson and, and Visma Lisa bike. No Phillips, so it really is all Van der Poel time. Alaphilippe yep. Philippe for, for Quick Step as well as Asgren. Uh, ja, Visma nearly did it, nearly did it. Visma Lisa bike. Also bring the <laughs> Laporte, Benoit, Jorgensen, Afini, Tratnik, Van Bala, so not a shabby team, one would say. Uh, Kung is there with no pithy. Pedersen also there with Sturva. Both look very, very good in uh, in Milan San Remo, but no Schoins. Navais, I dare say, will be Ineos best rider, although Tarling is there. Lascano, Velens, but no Pagacha for UAE. Arno Dali is here. Maybe I should have said he's the third favorite. Uh, for Lord of Destiny, if he crashes here, I don't think he should say this is a shit race. But <laughs> and Michael Matthews. He did not do opening weekend. 
I said that was a, a strange decision. That was vindicated by the team yesterday, coming second in San Remo. He also is is probably going to be top five in this race, given the shape he showed yesterday. So an interesting race, Benji, as a warm up to Flanders. Really? You expect Matthews to top five in this race? Why not? I don't know why. I always felt like he he's the guy that ends up in the in the end of the top ten because he wins a sprint in Group Two or Three. Yeah. Or he yeah. gets second in the sprint in group two Maybe or three. Maybe I'm overrating how good he is in the cobbles. Maybe he's better in the Italian style races. He's come sixth in the Tour of Flanders before. He's come fourth, fourth in Liège. That's strange. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe you're right. I think uh, I think this suits him better than the Tour of Flanders. Yeah. Though I think it's better. Amstel for... is what I'm waiting for for him. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and they need points out of him, so I think that he might even be going for a top five. But we all know going into this race that it's always about. The time better opening it up, so put your TV on early because shit will hit the fan in that race. Steinberg with about 80Ks to go is, uh, yeah, that's where it's opened up for many, many years. And uh, I can't wait to see, does Vanderpool with this team not look, his team doesn't look that good to me, really. Like, if I'm honest, Sir and Kraus form is, is questionable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yesterday you did say before the pod run, suddenly Alperson was back with 17 riders. Together with Vanderpool and Phillips. <laughs> yeah, but Søren Kraft finished. You're right. On, and he wasn't there on the yeah, podium this year. He wasn't there. Normally he is. And he's his second best rider tomorrow. On Friday at E3. So we'll see how they... Uh, but Vanderpool looks in such good shape. He can just win anyway with the mullet. Uh, Binny also, <laughs> we're hoping for a good result. But then on the Sunday, you have Gen which is a very, very different classic to E3 in the Tour of Flanders. Gen uh is really the... The main world tour race, or the biggest world tour race in, in West Flanders. Is it West Flanders or it's not? Because it's below It's Kent. not in West Flanders. But it is to the west, like. It's, it's on in the border East with Flanders. France. Yeah, but it... East got... Flanders is not in the east of Flanders. That's where people get wrong. But Ypres is in the west of Flanders. Yes. And they go through there. Yes. Okay. But they go from Ghent to Ypres and they go back. And they so start... they just were like, let's they... hop in the Muren. They, the start... they start in Ypres, though. Oh yeah, they moved the start to Ypres. Well, it's yeah. getting difficult, man. <laughs> they start in Ypres, Men in Gate, which I think is quite a nice start, actually. It's very iconic. Uh, the first 100Ks of 140Ks of flat, this is a very long race, 252Ks. Why is this called Hen Wevelgem, eh? Like, uh, I, don't, I don't know. It's Ypres Wevelgem. Yeah, but why do they call... Uh... Milan San Remo. It's Pavia San Remo. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of races like that. I mean... RVV. Well, that, that stays the same. <laughs> Paris-Roubaix. Don't start in Paris. Compiègne roubaix Yeah. Um, they do three times the Kemmelberg. They do the Belvedere side twice and the last side is the Oswear side, which is quite difficult. But that's still 40Ks or so from the finish. Last year, uh, Wout van Aert went solo. Well, not solo. He went with Laporte and then much to the ire of uh, Sporza gave the win to Christophe Laporte. Uh, and we'll see what happens this year. I don't think van Aert is doing it again. He's doing Dwarz Dor Vlandre. It's going to be Laporte, it looks like, on the provisional site list for Visma. Van der Poel is doing it, though, with Philipsen. Yeah. So how, I mean, that is the best team. You've got the best versatile, like, classic sprinter. Yeah. Who just won San Remo. And you have the best classics rider in the world. So. And yeah. also, with a lot of other teams, we'd be like, oh, can they play together? They've proven they just every single it. time. <laughs> All sweat them is our. That they've got the dynamic in the team that they can deliver. Yeah, yeah. So, really... Can I just point out yeah. that the guy in the audience that wanted us to do a weekly show just ran out? <laughs> oh, he's got a... He's young. Let him be. <laughs> um, he's probably got, probably got to clean your bike, Benji. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> oops. So, yeah, so uh, Morris also, he, he was in, in a good position last year. Tim O'Leary might win the race. If uh, they don't get rid of him, but I dare say they will. He also looked quite sharp, I thought, for Sudar Quickstep. But really, I'm looking at Van der Poel, Philipsa, and I, I'm, it's going to be very, very difficult to beat them. Uh, that's all the previews. Now we're getting into some of the news. And the most topical one is... We, I've seen this so many times in, in uh, basketball, in NFL, in, in, all, in cricket, like in chapel sort of guys saying, the, guys are, the, the competitors are too friendly now. And Armstrong said... He went on a podcast, not his own, and said, uh, yeah, he can't believe how the guys are all hugging each other at the finish line. Like, it virtually makes him sick. And um, <laughs> It virtually makes him sick? Sorry, but yeah. that's a stretch. <laughs> and, then, 
and then yesterday at the there was the Michael Matthews, Jasper Phillips, and and Pegaccio all had a big group hug at the end of San Remo. So, like, where do you stand on on Armstrong's statement? Where do I stand on that statement? Yeah. I think it's a stupid ass statement. Like, sorry, but are you going to tell me that every team should tell their riders you 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 can't be friends with anyone on competitive teams just in case they might be competitors in a certain race against you? Yes, there's rivalries in this sport, but. Those are built on actual rivalries and not just because they are the competitor. There's always more to it. Sorry, but I don't necessarily see Pogacar, Matthews, and, and Philipson as the one-on-one -on -one rivalries like that. Yes, we see Pogacar and Vigo respect each other after the races. Are they having a coffee with each other every weekday? No, they're not. Like Yeah, but don't you think there's also a difference there? Vingegaard, I don't think Vingegaard thinks it's necessary to go high five each other or like well after every mountain stage every single mountain stage Jonas is literally having his phone in the air looking for the GPS to call his <laughs> wife that's what I mean he's like he's just sort of in his own world um yeah but I don't hate it that riders are mature enough to see the difference between a race and real life the race is real life there's money on the line yeah that <laughs> no, it isn't all about the money. It's also about also our reputation. It's also about your reputation in the peloton. If you're Pogacar and you're like, oh, th this Vingago guy, congratulations, fuck that. Not giving him a hug, not giving yeah. him a hand. Like when he gave Half the, of the, he gave Van Bala a nice hug after Tour of Flanders 2022, I think. Half of the peloton <laughs> will start disrespecting you or disliking you if you're a, an asshole in the peloton. So yeah, yeah. there's also... Peloton dynamics involved, eh? Like, they also need to to keep relative allies in oh, certain races. Yeah, but I'm not saying... No, but that's, diff that's a different question. Like, not being a dick in the peloton, chopping somebody. I think it would annoy riders more if you're an asshole in the bunch, chopping everybody, yeah. being a nervous wreck, doing stupid shit, and then after the race, you're like all buddy-buddy. If, if I was a rider, that would piss me off a hell of a lot more than a guy who was really polite, friendly in the bunch, let you through if it didn't matter, and then after the race, he just went straight to his bus. I mean, I know which rider I would, rider I would prefer. Um, yeah, for sure, but why not both? Yeah, of course, of course, in an <laughs> ideal world. I mean, I think... I like uh, rivalries just as much as you do, <laughs> but I want there to be an actual narrative to it. I, want... I don't want there to be a, a, a rivalry just because... Okay, they're against each other in this race, so now they can't hug each other anymore. That sounds fucking stupid. Yeah, I mean, they can do what they want. I, I kind of, <laughs> I don't mind Armstrong saying it. I can get behind it a little bit. Like, I sometimes think it could be a little bit performative. Uh, and, but then maybe it's just good sportsmanship. Uh, I think it, I dare say it is. I think it's great to see that, yeah, maybe, yeah, guys can uh, come third or yeah, they're like, they're happy with it. We're also in the era, era of social media and riders also know that if they're respectful to their competitors after the finish line, they're, they're hanging out and so forth. It's got to be all over the internet and they're going to get good promotion from it. So that's also involved. And that good promotion is not just good for them, but also for their team, for their sponsors, stuff like that. And yes, Carlos Barreto and Rui Costa fighting each other with a wheel gets them on the news as well, but I'm not sure the sponsors are very happy with that. Which photo do you remember more from last year? <laughs> Will you remember more? The two guys hugging? Or the bench in MSR? You got it. The, be <laughs> the bench of Van Aert, Ghana, or what race was it? Was it MSR? Van Aert, Ghana, yeah. and Van der Poel, where they put them on a couch, I swear to God. This thing was too wide. You put like two Italian grandmothers on and they got three guys 190 centimeters next to each other. That photo was so good. Uh, apparently, though, it wasn't even awkward. Like they were just chatting and they just got captured at the wrong time. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a classic sort of uh, classic take that comes out from ex-athletes that it ain't the same as back in my day and we used to race. It was the same back in his day. He was hugging it out with Oleg on the bike. He was. was he? Yes, I've seen multiple pictures of it this week on Twitter. Fair enough. Um, really? Yeah. Well, I mean, unless it were, it was like deep <laughs> fake pictures, AI pictures. I, I doubt it. <laughs> let, let him fire some takes off. Come on. 
Uh, <laughs> Richard Pluger steps down from the AIGC P president's position. This is probably the least surprising news we've got this week uh, because it's, yeah, I'll, I'll say, I'll say from my perspective, obviously, that it's, it's a pretty thankless job. Yep. Uh, I'm not sure you, you're going to change your, it'll change your life doing it for the better, <laughs> uh, representing the professional cycling teams. And he came under a lot of criticism uh, from the various people, like even Cedric Vasseur, when the Outerbrooks saga was happening in November, Vasseur was on on Twitter being so telling him to resign, and he did. It, and it looks like <laughs> uh, Plugus, Plugus, <laughs> yeah, Plugus gave, came a st- gave out a statement. I'll read it out a bit more fully in a second, but gave a statement to the effect of, uh, "No, no, no problem, Cedric. Yeah, I'm resigning. Good luck to you. All. <laughs> I'm going to focus on my own team now. Like, good luck." Uh, but you're, um, but yeah, he actually said after serving as president of the AIGCP for three years and vice president before that, I feel it's time to hand over the gavel. I therefore did not stand for re election. I think it's healthy that our gavel changes regularly. By doing so, we professional teams share together the responsibility and much work involved, involved in the role in the AIGCP. For me, there's two sides to the story. I fully agree that it's a thankless job and you're more likely to have criticism then you're going to have people be happy with what you're doing. On the other side, this resignation also feels like I'm stepping out because I'm about to get stepped out anyway. Because everybody, well, not everybody, but I'd say well, more than half of the team. Le- there was an open letter, no? Yeah, there was an open letter to get him to... to yeah, from like 10 teams. To stop being in that role. So I'd say it's, it's like, for example, that I don't know, I'm a, I'm a bus driver. I start insulting fellow bus drivers and then the bus drivers want me to... This, this metaphor sucks. <laughs> and then the bus drivers want me gone. So I quit. But why, why, but why is the bus driver... <laughs> you just... <No. laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. It's uh, And, you know, there's a few things like the... It definitely comes with a higher level of responsibility for what you say in terms of if you're head of the AIGCP, then if you're critical of another team, it's like, well, which hat are you wearing? Obviously, yeah. you know, it, it's uh, that bit's difficult, but... That's why I believe that all these bloody organizations should have external people leading it. It, it is crazy that the head of the AIGCP is a... A team manager. A team manager, That yeah. makes no sense in my head. Um, so... I think it should be Luke. It should probably be someone, again? In, someone independent who's elected by... But then it's like, okay, then you've got to pay that person. You've got to get the right CEO, right? The right person yep. to do it. You've got to pay them 150 grand, 125 grand um, for that job. If it's going to be the right person, maybe it's a part-time job. I don't know. But uh, he steps down. Richard Pluger, maybe... Well, ben- it has to be a part-time job if a team manager can do it. Exactly. It'll take up your entire week. By definition. Uh, but it's maybe... Maybe he wants to focus on other things. Maybe the one cycling project is going to kick off in the next six months. Yeah. And so it's not possible to wear those those two hats if if some teams are in that and some teams are not. Three hats. Yeah. Speaking of team managers, uh, Patrick Lefebvre received a fine. I was quite surprised to see this, but yep. not not too. I wasn't dissatisfied either. Uh, that he received a fine for his comments. Well, the the media really said. Comments disparaging towards uh, women. He, the UCI says the fine will be suspended if he issues a public statement of apology and does not commit another breach. Uh, and this is obviously in relation to his uh, comments regarding Marion Roos earlier in an, was it a sports interview, Benji, or Belgian news? In Humor okay. magazine. Humor but, magazine, yeah, with, with Jose de Cao. Yes, but I will say... It shocks me that they don't specifically state what statement of Lefebvre led to this. We, we, it's, it's very lo- logical that it's that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But why would they not express specifically what it is? Because now they're like disparaging towards women. <laughs> like, <laughs> he said a few things that is disparaging towards women. It's his trademark sometimes. Yeah, it doesn't have a date attached to it. It just says it's a breach of the articles uh, 5 and 6 of the Code of Ethics. 
And uh, as a person subject to the UCI regulations, because he's a license holder, being a team manager, uh, he's subject to those. And uh, they've asked him basically to apologize or he's going to cop a, his wallet will be 20,000 Swiss francs lighter. So I don't know how stubborn Lefebvre is, but uh, yeah. maybe not 20 grand stubborn. So, but yeah, I will say there's three other things in this, and uh, and I feel like the UCI media they brought this out as like we've resolved four cases, we've rendered decisions in four cases. I feel like not putting any in the headline hides all of them because I'm going through this. I'm like, President of the Ukraine Cycling Federation, Bashenko, has been fined for the use of insulting language directed at incumbent officials within the National Federation as well as officials of the UCI, stuff like that. Uh, then the next one we've got um, the whole the whole thing about uh, Afghanistan where where cyclists um, there was a takeover by the Taliban or something and then cyclists didn't get the humanitarian aid and now they found no evidence that there were breaches of the ethics commission. I feel like every single one of these topics was like a major issue two years ago. And they're hiding it in this small UCI media result. It is very strange to release all these things in uh, in one go, but I guess the UCI Ethics Commission, they couldn't move themselves to maybe meet a little bit more regularly uh, <laughs> on an ad hoc basis. So they, they obviously met and, and dealt with these four cases. Over uh, the last two in, years, and in, they were like... Yeah, in, in one go. Uh, Lefebvre's one's obviously recent news, yeah. but uh, joking, he'll apologize. Take him back. Publicly? He needs to do it publicly, yeah, right? Yeah, do it publicly, yeah. Ooh. How public? What, what is a public... Yeah. An article in Humor? No, on, on, the, on, his, on his Twitter, on Instagram, on, his, yeah. on the Quickstep website. I, I would quick, respect if I was it quick if he step, does. If I was Quickstep, I wouldn't let him do it on the website. He should do it on his own He post. should. I respect it if he does. He should. Uh, I think he will not do it. <laughs> Principles. Uh, because it is unusual. I've not seen a fine like this before. Um, will he go to cost for it? No. That would no, be no. lame. That will cost you more. Uh, it's not. But depends. Depends. Uh, maybe he will. I don't really know the guy. Anyway, time to talk about money. The UCI. They did a lot of stuff yeah, this these week. Are, these, all these big news is <laughs> hidden in, in articles. And like when you look at the, when the UCI media Twitter account tweets it out, and then you see that the byline on the tweet, it has sometimes nothing to do with, yeah, the, the, the big news in there, which was yeah. like first PCC, Professional Cycling Counseling Council meeting, including stakeholders of women's professional road cycling, took place in, in Montreux uh, in Switzerland, which, uh, but the big news, which that was like, put up, that was the big news, which is great, yeah. but the, the big news was, uh, salary cap on the financial front and an yeah. extension to the reform of the organization of professional road cycling in 2018 the principle oh my voice of implementing a budget cap for teams was approved so a salary cap the principle of implementing a salary yeah what budget, does that mean like that they should do it and now for the next 18 months they'll look at how they should do it a working <laughs> group so and that, that's literally what it says yeah. a working group will be set up Rapidly. Rapidly. <laughs> so they'll get some cap experts in. Uh, US fans will know what that means, obviously because they're sports subject to salary caps. Uh, rapidly to present measures to the UCI Management Committee with a view to their application from the next renewal of teams, UCI Women's World Tour and UCI World Tour licenses, i.e. for the next cycle. So for the next cycle, 26, 27, 28, there could be a salary cap. Now, the, the idea that the CPA would agree to a salary cap is very surprising to me in a team, in a sport where there's supposed to be, you know, limited money or not unlimited money, that they would just agree to a salary cap. Surprising. Because uh, it's it should. I mean, unless they make it like baseball where it's just, yeah, there's a salary cap, but it's a really soft cap. And basically the big teams just spend anyway. Uh, and then the UAE can still have a, they can have a massive budget and pay a luxury tax. I mean, they're gonna have to go into all this stuff and enforcement yep. of people. This is not like it's in the US or North America where they're all in a uniform, uh, uniform uh, legislation. That these are these are 
You've got Australian registered teams and companies. You've got US. You've got uh, Israel. Like, and then, how successful has the financial fair play rules even been in sports yeah. like in sports like football? City have won. Yeah, I'm a United fan, but you know, City have won. Who knows how many uh, trophies? And there's an ongoing investigation into like 115 breaches of those rules. And then you've got, especially with the uh, golf money in there, with how do you even enforce it? Okay, so you can't give Pagacha or you can't give a superstar X money, but like how do you enforce, how is the UCI going to enforce it if people then, you know, give them assets outside yeah. of the salary? I don't know. Exactly. Like in simple terms, in my head, a salary cap for a team like a straight up budget cap without any other rules would mean that okay i would pay a superstar x amount of money and all the domestiques would be on like 60k yeah that's I would... how i that's my that's my strategy setting up that team so it would have to be more than that like you mentioned but then you're you're saying the right thing in there are riders that are being paid outside of the the team itself by a specific sponsor in a certain way or uh, a separate establishment or whatever that entity or whatever that's called like how the hell is that going to be controlled yeah very very difficult to enforce kind of opening pandora's box there but i guess people avoiding the rules doesn't necessarily mean that the idea is wrong in principle but uh i'm not sure i've seen many convincing arguments for a budget cap yep. i guess you could have redistributions because Shouldn't UAE, if UAE are going to sign Sivakov and exceed the cap, shouldn't they but have also, to pay a cap hit? A salary cap, I feel like cycling is still not at its potential finances, and a salary cap might stop it from financially innovating. Well, I mean, it, I don't really know why, what, like the motivation, what's the justification to play devil's advocate for the salary cap? It's, the, it's unfair for Cofidis, Antomache. Uh, the teams with with smaller budgets that, but isn't a salary cap even more unfair for the French teams because they have to high, pay a higher proportion of the salary yep. in taxes compared to a UAE or a Swiss registered team? So a salary cap is going to actually hit them maybe disproportionately. And as you said, what you just do is you pay the superstars the max, and then you get you you get the minimum guys, and then you'll probably still win the big races. So. But we'll see what they come up with. Maybe they design a really good system, but uh, that's that was just snuck in there, and I'm I don't know why the CPA hasn't come out uh, against it because I would not be agreeing to a salary cap yeah. in a sport where there is no uh, asset redistribution from the owners to the players, like in the US, where. When the salary cap negotiations, there's also negotiations of the collective bargaining agreement between the uh, athletes' union and the owners, and then you know there's a bit of a quid pro quo where okay, you want this changes to the salary cap, or the salary cap changes, or these changes, we want a higher revenue split or, or re of the uh, revenues from the league, but. That doesn't exist in cycling, so very, very surprising. Uh, that's all I've got, Benji. Yeah. We're uh, cooked. My head hurts, my nose hurts, my body hurts. It's time to stop the intelligent talking because I can't follow. So <laughs> let's, let's jump into a last-minute story time. Why am I fucked? Well, we had, uh, yeah, riding the cobbles all week. We, got a, we filmed a documentary this week. Uh, we've basically been based in the yeah, Flandrian Hotel, and then we've been going out and doing doing rides in, in Flanders mostly. And then we had a group ride even yesterday, San Remo watch along. And then uh, we went out to Roubaix today, which was to the Coles, which was really, really good filming some extra stuff. So it's something slightly different. It's definitely a big, it's definitely a lot more effort than sitting at home podcasting with each other, but it's, <laughs> yeah, hopefully it's worth it. So that will be coming out in a, a, maybe a week and a half. You'll probably see the fruits of that labor. But uh, until then, hope you enjoyed the update of the weekly show. We won't be doing Catalonia Stage 1 tomorrow. Poggy will probably win the uphill sprint anyway, so you heard it here <laughs> first. And uh, we'll be back for the Voltaire finish on Stage 2 on Tuesday. Until then, ciao.